Welcome everyone to uh, the Blue Lotus again. Um, this is going to be a really great talk um, on the magic of mushrooms. And um, I'm really interested and I feel like everyone here is because it's a full house. That's wonderful. Um, I'm going to introduce your speaker. We've got uh, Kathleen Bennett here and she is actually uh, a botanist, a, a clinical herbalist and a lecturer. So she knows a lot. Um, she loves sharing uh, information about herbology and planting. And why we're talking about the mushrooms today is because it's magic effects. Things like uh, penicillin, cholesterol lowering and uh, cancer treatments. So as you might have seen before, she was quizzing me on my mushroom knowledge and it wasn't very good. So I'm going to stay and at the end of this, I'm going to know so much more. So please. Kathleen Bennett, welcome her. Greetings and thank you for all coming. I'd like to start with thanking the Jinnabara people whose land this is on, also all of Australia, um, because I'm originally from the States. And um, to the mother of, that I was born to connects to the mother over here. I'd like to begin with a welcome song from a Cherokee Nation, which goes back to my great grandmother. And that's a Winda yeah, winda hey, winda hey, winda hey, 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 ya, ya, hey, hey, ya, ya, oh, oh, oh. Now, I want to clear up one thing first for anybody. It is not just about the magic mushroom. It is about as many of them as I can mix in as possible. Um, this is going to be a roller coaster ride of information. I will touch on as many of them as I can, except on penicillin. Um, you can ask me about that later. I think that's pretty much well done. Um, I have a picture up here. You can see a lovely picture of Ganoderma lucidum, the shining one. And I love this picture because it looks like it's smiling back at you. Over at the top on the, uh, this side is maitake, the hen of the woods, not chicken of the woods, which is a mushroom that tastes like chicken. Shiitake and lion's mane. Okay. A little magic thing. This is a lovely poster and it shows just a sampling. I could probably talk for 12 weeks, twice a week, three hours a day, and not really cover everything on mushrooms. So. History. Some of the oldest known artwork is the Tassili rock art. It goes back, um, that's in Algeria. Yeah. And you can see there's pictures here. So some of the, the oldest known human representation of a mushroom is associated with psilocybin. There's another one. This is a psilocybin in Spain. You can see the artwork on the side. It shows the little Bendy knee, which is characteristic of the Psilocyba hispanica. This one is in Spain. Now, another different type of mushroom, Otzi, 2300 BC, was found frozen in a glacier in the Alps. And on he was, all his things were carried with him. He had, including tinder conch, which is Fomace fomentarius, and birch polypore. Now, the interesting thing about both of these is they're used to start fires. The tinder conch is also used to carry ash it's also a vulnerary, which means it's good for healing wounds. It's antiseptic, antimicrobial, immune modulating. We'll get to that later. If you take a lot of it internally, it's emetic and a laxative, all of which are very important. If you ever go back to any of the other herbs, you will find that anything that's called holy, it generally had a laxative effect somewhere along the lines. Birch polypore, anti-inflammatory, antibiotic. So you can start fires, you can heal your body. Great thing to carry on a long trip. Australian polypores. These are rhodophomatopsis. This is, these are things that are also used by Aborigines. So Latoporus portentosis, it's used as tinder to carry fire and may have been eaten in Tasmania. There is not much research done on it, so there's a great opportunity. Rhodophomatopsis lilacinogilva. Anyway, um, it's a gram-positive bactericide and active against the Bacillus cereus. And those both grow here native. Life cycle, how mushrooms grow. Really important to understand this because when you use it for medicine, it depends on which part of the medicine, that, which part of the mushroom you're getting. So you have the spores, the development of mycelium, then the fruiting body. When it's mature, 
just before the spores are ready for dispersal. That's usually when it's harvested. Um, although it's really important if you're harvesting from the wild to always leave, do not take more than half ever because you want to let the spores disseminate across um, and produce more mushrooms. Ooh. There we go. Fruiting body. This is the traditional medicine. Mycelia was not generally used because it's generally in the soil, very tiny, very fine, and very friable. However, being very intelligent people that we are, human beings, we learned how to cultivate just the mycelia in laboratories and in industrial plants, and we get huge maps of the stuff now. And that's actually one of the most commercially available forms of mushroom these days. But it's very important to know about the difference, and we'll talk about that. So two considerations in the fungal is the fungal species and the substrate. The active constituents are the medicinal polysaccharides. These are produced naturally in the fungus. Sometimes when they're commercially produced, they found that if I feed the mushrooms like you would a goose, you can fatten them up with polysaccharides, but they will not necessarily be the same medicinal ones. So always, uh, if you have sourcing mushrooms, always get a reputable source. Always know uh, where they're grown and how they're grown. Uh, make sure you don't get something that's really cheap because it's probably not the real deal. Um, Miles and Chang say, this is a, a study because one of the attractive features as an agricultural product is they can be grown in a variety of agricultural, industrial, and household waste. So um, in China, they actually found that they would grow the mushrooms to help break down the waste. But then what do you do? Well, you know, once you take them off the waste and dry them, they look just like the ones grown for food. And so some of these actually get into commerce. Um, but they are great bioaccumulators. So they are known to actually draw things up from the waste that they're breaking down. So you want to make sure that you only get mushrooms grown for food. Now, one exception to this, I think, is life cycle. These guys grow lovely mushrooms, generally pleurotus, which are oyster mushrooms, on coffee grounds. And they take up a little bit of the caffeine. So for all of you people there that like your caffeine in the morning, now it's a minuscule amount, but it's still there. And it's really good. And they sell kits. That's what they're holding. Life cycle. Mycochemicals. So in the mushrooms, there's a wide variety. You get polysaccharides, which is one of the, the medicinal constituents. And they vary mushroom to mushroom. You get the 1,3-beta-glucans, which is what everybody's using as the standard. They'll say, this mushroom has 70% 1,3-beta-glucans. Well, you notice that S on there, beta-glucans. There are many variations. So with things like, say, coffee, tea, and, and chocolate, coffee has caffeine. Tea has caffeine and theophylline, which is a little variant of the molecule for caffeine. And chocolate has theobromine, which is another little variant. And so they're very similar stimulants, but each one's slightly different on the product. The same thing's true with the beta-glucans. Now, there are 70% usually in the fruity body. 10 to 15 percent in the mycelia, unless, of course, you really start to pump things in to try to increase that thing, but they won't necessarily be the right ones, um, usually protein-bound. There are proteins, flavonoids, less lectins, um, EFAs, essential fatty acids, and many ones. They used to say that mushrooms were non-nutritive. Well, in fact, they're packed with nutrition. Um, sesquiterpenes, triterpenes, which steroid-like, which means that really increases their um, medicinal effect. Thiol derivatives, sulfur-bearing compounds, also very medicinal. Trace elements, minerals, and vitamins, all those vitamins. <laughs> so what are immunomodulators? So when you see people talking about um, mushrooms, it's immune modulation. It means immune change. So some mushrooms change are stimulants. They'll stimulate the uh, immune system. Some are depressants, so they slow the immune system down. And some are actually called, uh, they bring the immune system back into alignment. There's the least amount of research about these because it's hardest for scientists to sort of measure. If you've got something that can go a little this way or a little that way, it drives them crazy. They just don't have enough room for that. Pleurotus, all the oyster mushrooms are really, really good for that. So immune modulators are defined as botanical medicines that alter the activities of the immune system by a dynamic regulation of informational molecules. So there's a lot of stuff happening. 
cytokines, hormones, neurotransmitters, and other peptides. And just in case you think it's all simple, so here's a summary on the immunosuppressants and immunostimulants. Now we go next one. Now, the different types of fungi. So your parasitic fungi, the mycelium are often very high in your immunodepressants. Why? Well, because they're attacking a live entity. Um, cordyceps attacks caterpillars, bugs, um, a different species. The bracket fungi may attack a live tree. And what they want to do is they want to depress the, the um, host defense system to allow their mycelia to grow. Um, the fruiting body that comes up and grows out then is usually less dense in those and more sometimes in immunostimulants. You have your coprophilic psilocybin that loves to grow on dung. Um, symbiotic. Now, chanterelles and your mycorrhizals, uh, and chanterelles and mycorrhizal mushroom, grows in connection with certain trees and things, but it doesn't kill them. It actually enhances their growth um, and performance. And they would all, all those different types, changes the assemblage of chemicals in them. This is to give you an idea, we're not going to talk about it, of how complicated the immune system is. And the, when I say an immune stimulant, it could stimulate in any particular part. Some mushrooms stimulate the B cells, some stimulate the macrophage. Macrophage are kind of like the Klingons of the cell world. They go out and destroy. Um, you got your um, T cells, B cells, your inflammation phase, some will slow down inflammation, some will actually increase it to help get rid of things. So just keep this in mind when it says immune modulating, what of, which one of these does it do? It usually won't say. There's another thing here is a cellular level. And it's very interesting. They've now found out that things like malaria also contain immunosuppressants and really change the way the immune system works. They know about biofilms. Um, so a lot of people have trouble. Um, IB, uh, bowel disorder, IBD. Um, it's sometimes associated with biofilms. And again, it's cellular communication and thwarting the immune system. Now, the big five. Commercially, these are the ones you're gonna come across most often in high demand, and we'll talk about the illegal one later. Reishi, Ganodema lucidum, we saw a picture before. It's known as the shining one. This is commercially produced. I saw a great picture of room longer than this one with rows of little lacy up like this, sort of like, <laughs> The orders called Ganodermum aplanatum. Both of these occur in Australia. Actions, antibiotic. In tests, it is outperformed. Ampicillin, tetracycline, fluconazole against molds, gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria. Uh, there's a list of them there. It's antiviral. It's been shown effective against HIV, HPV. It's a nociceptive. It actually helps reduce pain, which means it's probably reducing inflammation and irritation. And it's neuroprotective, memorogenic. There's an M missing in there. Anti-amnesiac. And it stimulates the growth of nerve connections. Continued. <laughs> it's known to be anti-angiogenic, anti-thrombotic, so it helps break up clots. Uh, Hypercholesterolemic, it helps sort of balance the cholesterol. It doesn't reduce, it actually balances. Anti-BPH, um, that's... Um, Retinal protective, down regulates TNF alpha, tetro, well, I'll forget that. Anyway, those are, those are more cellular names. Gastroprotective, anti-ulcer, both aplanatum and lucidum are known to protect the stomach. Uh, radioprotective, it's great as an adjuvant, that means something taken along with uh, chemotherapy to help support the body, um, protect against the radiotherapy without interfering with the actual thing. And that's one of the magic things about reishi. Sleep-inducing, uh, more a relaxing thing, more adrenal kind of sleep-inducing rather than sedative. Um, and an antidepressive, it acts as an adrenal tonic. And the adrenal aspect is um, sort of an overall well-being kind of thing. And that's specifically uh, G. lucidum. Reishi products, there is a reishi toothpaste. Dr. Weil does reishi, co reishi cosmetics. And a recipe. Now, reishi as a powder, and that's, we're saying the fruiting body only, not the uh, mycelium, is intensely bitter. So to make a medicine for someone, um, say that, you know, it's having particular issues, particularly uh, maybe pre-cancer, they've been saying, or they've got BPH issues, prostate problems, um, even, you know, worried about breast cancer, 
peanut butter bowls are the way to do it because you can put enough uh, reishi in, say two weeks time, that's using a quarter to a half teaspoon depending on your uh, body weight per day. You mix it in the bowls, you mix in some honey, you'll need a binder, so I variably change it around, almond meal, uh, really powdered coconut, coffee, cocoa, it changes the flavor too, it makes it a little different. And then work it into bowls, separate it, so I have at least 14, one for each day, or 28, two for each day. It's a great way to do it, probably. Um, this is a common one in Australia. It, very little research done, but the research done shows that it's also neuroprotective, immunostimulant, um, phag that means it can, that phagocytosis and IL-8 production, which is associated with your immune system, and anti-tubercular helps resist, it promotes resistance to the um, tuberculosis infection. Maitake, this is hen of the woods, that's because of his little ruffled tail feather there. Its actions, it also does immune support. Um, so if you're taking something, of, say if you've got chemotherapy, whatever, it doesn't really interfere so much as supports your body uh, because of the way it acts. Antiviral, anti-metastatic, uh, really good for people who are concerned about recurrence. Uh, pancreatic protective, one of the very few. Um, I know that there's been increase in pancreatic cancer and this is really a good protective. Radioprotective, again, good for people taking chemotherapy. An ovulation stimulant. I haven't fully sussed this one out yet, but I thought it was very interesting. Again, um, good for hypercholesterolemic uh, and antiangiomic. Contains triterpenes, beta glucans, and there have been isolated specimens found in Australia. What you do have is this is the Australian head of the woods, Grifola colensi. I couldn't find any research done on it, so there are anybody's in uni, this is a good opportunity. Shiitake, Lentinula idodes. Suppresses tumor forming cytokines. So we have a little bit of a shift in action here. It's used um, as a mouthwash. Anti it helps prevent caries. It's good against plaque formation, um, anti gingivitis. So, anybody that's been told by their doctor they've got gingivitis and they're stuck with it for life, I'd say give a shiitake mouthwash or just start eating it on a regular basis. Immunostimulant, boosts your immune system. Um, again, it's a statin alternative, anti-atherosclerotic, and it's an anti-malarial. And it's a, a key constituent is the lentinin. That's, a, that's one of the beta-glutins. Lion's mane. This is a really special one. It's endangered in some areas in the U.S. Um, there are some in the U.S. here, but they also have uh, heresium coralloides. Its actions are that it's antiviral, is again, it's neurogenic and helps stimulate no nerve growth. It protects the brain and it protects the whole nervous system. It's a beta amyloid inhibitor. That's the plaque that builds up in Alzheimer's disease. It's gastroprotective. And that's both the coralloides, which is the common form here in Australia, and this is uh, Aranaceus, which is the icicles that we saw. Cardioprotective, helps protect the heart. And its big one is the meroterpenoids. Now, interestingly enough, Lion's mane is also helps to regulate the circadian clock. You can't really see it here, but your body operates on a sort of a repair cycle. Um, melatonin secretion begins. That's part of why you get sleepy and drowsy. Uh, it says when you're 1030, your bowel movements start to be suppressed. That's actually when the bowel system repair begins. So if you don't go to bed till noon, to midnight, you could actually be interfering with the clock's repair cycle for your stomach. And if you have stomach problems, there might be a reason. You get your deepest sleep, and during the night, it doesn't show it on here, your, um, your brain repair is the, gets a reflux. You get your deepest sleep in your dreams because that's your body sort of recycling all the memories, experiences of the day, sort of reshuffling things around. And the fact that lion's mane can help sort of balance this out is pretty incredible. There's the Australian version. If you've seen that in the woods, it's really beautiful. It's, it's kind of like got a Christmas tree sort of icicle effect. Cordyceps. I'm really passionate about people learning about cordyceps. I avoided it for a long time. I tend to use it very seldom and with great respect. Originally, only the fruiting body, that's the little point in the front, was connected. Um, but demand and value have really pushed um, it to the point of uh, it's threatened in the wild in Tibet where it was grown. 
and it is vastly, vastly adulterated in commercial products. If you, if you ever have an opportunity to get cheap cordyceps, it probably isn't. Um, and unfortunately, because of the adulteration, dealers began to demand the entire thing. So instead of leaving the caterpillar in the ground with some of the mycelia so that it could uh, sort of spread a little, um, they began demanding the whole thing, to uprooting it, getting it out of the soil. And there's a huge ecological impact as a result of that. Here's a person. What they're doing is they're looking for cordyceps. That's the kind of climate it grows in. A steep mountain, hillside, sparse vegetation. Now, it's now called Ophiocordyceps sinensis. The actions are cardioprotective. It increases stamina and endurance, and it's been really in big demand by people who are into athletics, um, working out, and things like that. It's also an adaptogenic and HPA adrenal. So a lot of your, um, I would say, some of your uh, um, immune-related, um, uh, spacing the name out, syndrome, when you're tired all the time. Anyway, um, if you're tired all the time and it's a chronic condition, uh, this will help to adapt it. When you're under stress for a long period of time, your adrenal gland actually begins to shrink, but it's recoverable. And things like cordyceps and some of the other mushrooms can really help with that. Adenosine compounds. Scarlet Caterpillar Club, this is Cordyceps militaris. This is also very, very medicinal. Um, it grows on a different type of fat uh, fungus. Now the thing about cordyceps, I should go back one, there, is that the medicine, the spores go to a very specific caterpillar, which is eaten in the herbs of that particular environment. And those herbs are actually taken into the fungus, which grows only in that area. So the medicine is very specific to that caterpillar, that fungus, and that environment. This is a whole different fungus with a different bug. It's actually gonadal. It helps protect the um, gonads, both male and female. It's been known to be spermatogenic. It is also anti-fatigue, but not as um, notably so as sinensis. This is Isaria cicadae. Um, this is another one that used to be called Cordyceps cicadae. It's shown that the fruiting body and the insect body have absolute, ap opposite properties. As I mentioned before, think about it. The spores hit the bug. They've got to subdue the bug's natural immune defenses. And so it's going to be immunodepressing until the mycelia get going. When it's finally ready to produce the um, fruiting body, the fruiting body itself is immunostimulant. Fruiting bodies are immunostimulating, increasing the levels of IL-2, which is an interleukin, which is part of your immune system. Insect bodies lower the IL-2, uh, along with uh, IL-4, interleukin-5, um, and 12. The important thing is, when they started gathering the, the, the caterpillar body and the fruiting body, they didn't want to waste it, so they started grinding them up together. Well, if you've got something that stimulates IL-2 and then something that depresses IL-2, you wind up with a net zero. Um, so by having both together, they can say it's 100% cordyceps, 100% gathered in the wild, but you're not necessarily getting the medicine that you need. Neuroprotective. A lot of the things about the magical mushrooms is that they protect your brain. Cordyceps gunnii, this is one of the Australian cordyceps. There's not much research. Um, it's been used as an adulterant. It has the little bit that's on it. It's immunosuppressant, but that's only the mycelia, which I already would expect them to be immunosuppressant. Go on. Other ones, now we're going to move on to another group, are the psilocyba, the oyster mushrooms, enoki, and truffles. Psilocyba, this is one, the liberty caps. Um, the basic one that was in that picture of the tassili man was actually psilocyba semilanceata. And you can see them peeking out between the grasses here, nice little bat, called liberty caps because they used to represent the caps worn by Reverend. They had a little tilt over a tip. In Australia, they've been found in Tasmania, Queensland, and southern New South Wales. They contain both psilocybin and baocystin. Um, they've now come to the conclusion, after doing some research, that psilocybin is probably safer to take um, especially in low dosage, than either um, LSD or marijuana. And so it's been the key, it's been the drug of choice for treating depression. 
um, and we'll talk about in a little bit right here. So it was first ice, and it wasn't isolated at, until 1960, and that's R. Gordon Wasson um, and Hoffman, uh, two great uh, chemists in America. When consumed, now the consumption is based on body weight, but for the average person of average weight, about three grams gives you the beginning level of hallucinations. Um, to microdose, you need to take at least a tenth of that. Um, so it's, it's a hit or miss thing unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, it, people have been taking it recently to enhance clarity and focus, and it actually has shown a lot of promise uh, also as an adrenal restorative. But they, they said the brain is actually wired to keep us ready for danger, especially in our modern society. And what it seems to do is it opens up, it relaxes those um, in those, those inhibitions, um, those always on alert, always, you know, uh, like you would have in PTSD, always on guard for danger, and allows us to just experience. And the clarity and the sense of connectedness to the earth really comes out. So it's very, very important, and that's one reason why um, it's being used effectively for depression, mental illness, PTSD. Um, but the one caveat is you want to have it in the right setting because when you let go, you don't want something to come in. So if you've got like um, a brother-in-law who's always angry and going to come over and yell at you while you're doing this, not a good thing. You want to be in a safe place where it's nice and quiet. You can relax. You feel relaxed. Um, that's why I think some of the institutional use of it has been really good. Go on. Uh, antidepressive, it actually inhibits negative emotions in the amygdala, which is really good. PTSD, it also in, it increases SSRIs, including serotonin, which is the most common treatment for depression without being chemical and without all the side effects. That oyster mushroom, I love oyster mushrooms. I don't just like the way they taste, I think they're just really magic. Um, they're not parasitic, they're symbiotic, they're actually um, a mycorrhizal with a really large fruiting body. This one here is the white oyster mushroom. There is one called the golden oyster, and I've had that one grow. Smells like apricots, doesn't have cyanide. Um, lovely and very high in beta carotene. So anti-dysentery, antiviral, um, analgesic, that's particularly pulmonary. Anti-Alzheimer's helps uh, remove plaque and sort of stimulate nerve growth. Um, acetylcholinesterase is associated with, that's the um, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are what a lot of pharmaceuticals do to try to treat Alzheimer's, and this actually works, uh, has a natural one in the mushroom. It's also gastroprotective and gonadal protective. Um, those are really hard to define medicinally. It basically just sort of helps with repair of those organs and helps protect them against sort of attacks. Enoki, Flamulina. Oh, I don't have much on that because there wasn't. Enoki is widely eaten. Um, there are some studies, um, some of them are in Japanese, um, but there, I couldn't find any really good ones in English. But uh, that is also a nice one for um, just general overall support. Truffles. That includes tuber species. This is a picture of tuber. Uh, this is your Paragord truffle, the most expensive one in the world. And Turfezia, which are called the desert truffles. And there's some of them. You have some of those species here in Australia. It's an aphrodisiac, one reason why it's so popular and so expensive. The desert truffles, so you get the white and the black, tuber and melanosporum and magnatum. Treats impotence, related to aphrodisiac, but also from a different aspect. So, um, so sort of the whole thing about sexuality is a process. So it's a matter of not just being able to perform, but it's even following through the whole thing. Um, also good for analgesic and pain relief. And interestingly enough, it binds endocannabinoid. So it's uh, interesting. I know there was a talk yesterday on uh, cannabis, um, and it binds with the receptors. That's uh, T. melanosperm. Now, I'm just going to run through. A couple of other ones we got, so I'll have some time. Um, this is called the concealed polypore. It's anti-asthma. It helps support people with allergies. The lyophyllum decastase, the Japanese honey mushroom, also immune um, depressing. And it's also good for atopic dermatitis. Antiprotozoals, we've got the snow fungus and the milk white brittle gill. 
Um, these are against parasites uh, that get into the intestinal system that can be really hard to get rid of. Coccidia and Leishmania are well known in some of the hotter countries. Uh, vulnerary and wound healing. You've got your tinder conch, the Fomes fomentarius, also the um, Australian versions, the lilac uh, ogilvus. Puffballs, they, I don't have anything about them treating humans, but they have been used to treat cattle wounds, which I thought was very interesting. Nutritive, they're very nutritive. Um, saffron milk cap has calcium, sodium, potassium. You've got all sorts of vitamins, minerals. Um, lion's mane contains amylose, uh, which is also found in rice and potatoes, of potatoes, and your vitamins. Australian truffles are very important water source because they would become sort of juicy. Antibacterial and gut, I don't know, you know, about quorum sensing. So the idea is that uh, it's like a, when you have a meeting and you have enough quorum to make a decision. Well, if you get enough of the bacteria, they will form, they will get together and actually form a film to pretend, the, pretend them from getting ejected from your system. And it's known that a certain mushrooms actually help disrupt the quorum sensing, which also helps uh, prevent the biofilm. So Felinus, and I'm only giving you the, the scientific name because in different countries around the world, the same common name um, can be different species. And this is really important with fungi because even in the same country in different locations, they can contain different constituents. They're very chemovariant. Amazing. Okay, anti-helicobacter. Helicobacter pylorus is probably uh, responsible for causing almost 80% of the um, lower intestinal cancer, um, acid reflux, um, irritable bowel. A lot of that is all associated with this little tough to kill bacteria, and these will help um, sort of reduce their effect. An anti-MRSA, which is a methoxylin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, a big problem, especially in hospitals, and that would be topical. And you can make a tea with them, and a, which is what a lot of the Aborigines do with some of their mushrooms. Um, some of them are too bitter to drink, so it's good to mix them in a soup with a lot of flavorings. Brains and nerves. These are memorogenic, neurotonic, help boost the nerves, um, enhance the memory. Uh, flamulina is called the um, lobster mushroom. That's an enoki-related one. Uh, so it is the Renoki one. So um, chaga, cognitive enhancing. Uling um, sheng, silver ears are neurogenic. So some of them increase the nerve production. They used to think that your brain skin. skin. Anti-aging, hydrating, anti-wrinkle and skin whiteners. These are all products on the market. Uh, the big one, which you probably can't read, is actually a men's skin hydration. And there's so much more to discover. I didn't talk about Amanita muscaria because that's a whole lecture in itself. But it, and also because right now it's primarily been found as a hallucinogenic and a very strong one. Um, and it also varies according to where it's grown. I don't think there's any studies on the Amanitas that grow here in Australia. And I have seen them when we were going through the... Um, coming from the Blue Mountains over the, right, the dividing range. Uh, we stopped in place, and there was this sort of pine grove of non-native pines, and right there smack in the middle was the Amanita muscaria. Um, in Siberia, the species there, they're often dried, which reduces their toxicity. But so again, it's just for the communication, spiritual level, um, hallucinogens. The takeaway, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. If you eat these mushrooms, chlorotis is especially good. You can get the benefits at a low level on a regular basis and sort of bring your body back into alignment. Always give thanks to the plants um, because they give to you and they are they, not its. Take only what you need if you're in the wild and use all that you take. Do not just over harvest because there will be less the next time. Source your mushrooms locally and ethically. Uh, know your sources. And don't ever go cheap. It's really not going to be worth it. You're not going to get the medicine that you thought you were getting and you'll wind up spending more money. And know that not all the immunomodulators are all the same. Um, the mycelia and the fruiting body are definitely different. Resources. Um, I actually got involved in this. I was like, as a clinical herbalist, I kind of shied away from the mushrooms because I just couldn't get a grip on 
they have one effect on one person and another effect on another person. And I couldn't understand it, so I began researching it. And Dr. Duke has started this database um, with the USDA, and he had started with mushrooms. He had a couple hundred, and just wasn't interested. And so it sat for about 25 years, and he, for some reason, decided to give the database to me, and I increased it to several thousand. And we put a lot of the basic information up there. So if you go in and type Ganoderma, you will get a lot of resources for that. You've got local fungal foray groups. Join one, go out in the woods with them. They will troop around in their rubber gum boots um, and gather up mushrooms and identify them and sort of get in touch with how they grow and where to find them. Paul Stamet. So if I could recommend one thing and everybody should do, it's to see to watch the six ways mushrooms can change the world. He talks not just about the medicine, but also about the environmental and ecological thing. I know there's another speaker here at Woodford, and she's really big on, on how it's really good for breaking down waste, and you can build with it, you can build make clothing with it. Paul Stamets wears a hat that's made out of uh, Fomes fomentarius. Uh, Fungi Perfecti, that's the uh, website associated with Paul. And the last one is Species Fungorum. If you're not sure uh, if a name, a scientific name is correct, you can go there and type it in and it will tell you if that's the correct name. And that's my slideshow. So I know it's a lot. I know I read through it really quick. Psilocyba alone because there are so many different species and different ones have different medicines in them. So if you have any questions? Uh, yeah? No, no, there's some... Um, if you think about it, what do mushrooms like? They like moist. What are the lungs? Moist. What do they like? Dark. What are the lungs? Dark. Dark and moist. Um, if, if you did get an infection, what I would suggest is go, unfortunately, go to a doctor and they can generally, you know, give something to clear it up. Mostly if you're working with them, try not to work with them when they're actively sporing. Um, and especially if you know that it's uh, a toxic one. Australia has this lovely one that fluoresces green at night. Um, yeah, you don't want to go breathing the spores of that. And there's another one that's green all the time. Um, and so you want to be careful. Yeah, you don't want to be, just, just cover your face with a wet scarf, you'll be fine. Anybody else? Um, can you just say anything about the benefit of eating normal mushrooms? Just oh, so, so agaricus campestris. Should they be organic? I mean, yes, yes, yes. Agaricus campestris. Um, yeah, I was thinking. Oh, there are so many mushrooms. So yeah, um, agaricus vesperus, agaricus campestris. Those are the field mushrooms, the little ones. You can get you get organic ones that are grown. Um, they are also medicinal and uh, in general. It's not as dramatic immunostimulant but it's certainly um, anti slightly antiviral, antibacterial, um, good for your gut, and it tastes good. What? Um, the general feeling of, from mushroom hunters is that you shouldn't eat any of them really raw. I have eaten agaricus campestris, those little button mushrooms, stuffed with uh, guacamole, the ball, and it hasn't done me any harm. I wouldn't do it a lot, um, the much better cooked, just just in case there's anything that does break down. That cook it? Oh, so. Yeah. Um, on the topic of having them cooked, I've heard that having the most um, benefit from the mushroom is to crack the cell walls. Do you have any way of preparing them to get the most benefit from them? Of what? Mushrooms? Like the reishi, like cracking the cell walls. The reishi is, um, okay, as when it grows, you saw the way it looked? Okay, that's like a rock. It's hard. It has to be ground, so you can't go out and harvest it unless you're prepared to mill it down into a powder. Um, so it's really best if you've gotten it from someone who has um, processed it. It used to be Chinese pharmacists and then other and now we've got some commercial venues. Um, you take it as powder. As I said in the beginning, it's intensely bitter. 
Um, if you like that sort of thing, you can make just your little uh, tea and slug it down. It'll be an experience you won't forget. Um, I recommend the um, peanut butter balls, almond butter balls, uh, anything to sort of get it into the gut, plus the um, the fats in the almond butter, peanut butter, slow down your digestion and allow you to really absorb all those um, beta, yeah, beta glucans. Does that help? But frying them, cooking them, boiling them, um, all that people have taken the um, as a tea. Uh, you have to see how, try a little and see what you like. Yes. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure you've been familiar that there's been a lot of bushfires running all across Australia. But what um, some friends of mine have realised is three after, three days after a lot of these burns, there's a bunch of really interesting mushrooms coming up. Do you know anything about them? What they're up to? Mm -hmm. So I'm not fully up, uh, I've only been here three years, up on my, all of my Australian uh, fungi. Um, the ones that grow on live trees um, may burn off, may not, the mycelia are deep in the trees. So if the tree survives, they will, they will survive. The ones that come on the ground, since Australia is a farm maintained system, you will have species, um, you'll have orchids, you will have er plants, you'll have tree seeds that will sprout, and you will have fungi that are dedicated to coming in after a fire. So it's actually after a rain and after a fire are two important times to go foraging. But again, if you are going to forage, don't take ever take more than half. If you can, leave a sign, put some rocks in a peace symbol or something so people know that someone has been there, um, and leave some behind. Yes? I think she's going to give you the... Oh. <laughs> yeah. Where are we? Over here. You okay. Um, I was just wondering if you had any advice on um, getting mushrooms sustainably, um, where to source them? Well, I've been to a couple of local markets and there are local growers. Um, I think you can talk to the fungi guys here um, and they'll be really good. Um, and just go to your local markets and check your uh, check the internet for suppliers in your area. If you want to grow your own, um, we had a friend and uh, he had some prostate issues, uh, really, really bad. Um, they couldn't do anything until like, the inflammation went down, he wasn't getting anywhere. And I said, well, you know, it doesn't hurt to try. And I told him Perotus uh, austriatus, the oyster mushroom, um, within a week, of his starting to eat those every day. Um, the inflammation began to go down and he was able to go through with his treatment and uh, and uh, everything seemed to work a lot better after that. Yes. Anybody, uh, somebody over here had a question? Yeah. I don't know where that microphone is. In my garden in, uh, in Brisbane, after heavy rains, I get like a, I, I can only think it's a mushroom, and it's very bright fluorescent orange, like a tree, with two branches coming out on either end. And when I water, when I'm watering the garden, I get this big cloud of black dust coming out. Okay, so the bust will be the spores, and it's a coral mushroom. Um, I would, if you want to know, I would contact your local, look for fungal foray or fungal group in your area, and maybe they'll come out and take a look at it for you, uh, let you know if it's toxic or not. Um, if it's toxic, you may want to try to move it someplace else. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Uh, hello. <laughs> I'll thank you for the talk, lots of information. Um, you mentioned the uh, oyster mushroom is actually a mycorrhizal mushroom. My understanding of mycorrhizal and ectos, they need this roots to grow. They, roots, yeah, right. They grow the roots of the trees. Right. But we can fruit an uh, oyster on straw and grain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you explain that? Um, it's a breakdown. I mean, they found that a lot of the a lot of the mycelium will grow on other things. It's just that the when they're growing with the trees, they're going to have the better nutrients because they're an exchange. But it doesn't mean that they're not any good. And yes, the as I said, the pleurotus is what they grow on the coffee coffee grounds. So you're still getting a good food product. Um, it just might not be as intensely medicinal. It'll be the same as ginseng grown in the woods as ginseng grown 
in a field under cultivation. There'll be a slight change, but there'll still be the general general um, effect. And the flavor should still be good. It'll be tasty. Any? Yes. Hi. Do you know much about ryebrax, which is a derivative of reishi? The right, the red. Rishi. It's called ryebrax. It's a. It's like a. Um, I think it's the spores of the reishi that are um, ingrained on oats, and then it's used as like a medicine. It's, there's a lot of research on that as being quite good. No, 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 I don't know that one. Oh. Uh, now, what is the? It's which which species of reishi? I'm um, not too sure. And can you spell it? R I B A X. Ryebrax. That sounds like a more modern name, so I'm not sure. I can look that up, though. Um, send me a letter from the post office with that on it, and I will definitely get back with you on it. Okay, thanks. I mean, I said I have a database with thousands, thousands of lines of species and medicinal things. Yes. Um, can you tell me more about taking lion's mane? Is it something that you could take daily, and if there's a recommended amount? I have started having some of it, so I'm just wondering. So, and one day I took a low, so I was just like wondering. Well, if it's when, it like, com when it comes, buyout, kind of buyout. so without um, any kind of dosage, you really should be under the care of a clinician. Or if buy a product, um, I don't know if they have them here, but they they don't have the fungi perfecti here, but um, they they do have other uh, sources, and they will come with recommended dosages on them. Or it should be under the care of an herbalist. I mean, I really wouldn't give anybody um, dosages, um, you know, just offhand. And you're very slightly built, so you might need less than say the average person. So it's really important. But um, yeah, lion's mane is phenomenally wonderful. Anybody? Yes. <laughs> well, then we'll come around this side. Um, I got told when you're collecting mushrooms from the wild, you're supposed to sort of squash them around, and does that uh, spread out the spores? To it depends. So the thing with pleurotus, like the oyster mushrooms, they're actually they actually want to be eaten because normally people would eat them and they would be living in the area, and the spores would get spread through um, the fecal matter, um, and that's not happening. So anything to sort of promote the spread, but if you don't take them all, then you automatically sort of allow some to, to develop in the area. Um, if they're growing in a lot of root area, um, actually with the oyster mushrooms that are growing and associated with the tree, you can actually see them along the root lines of the trees spreading out into the yard, which is really, really beautiful. Um, so yeah, you can do that. Um, it's always good to give back, and I said don't ever take more than you need, and make sure that and what you're doing there when you squash one or two is that you're making it so that somebody can't take them all. But if the spores aren't ready, um, you're not really helping the spore production. That's a big problem with the cordyceps, is because it's taken before the spores are released, and so. There's no spores out there to find new, find new new caterpillars, and they're getting rid of two and two or of them. Um, yep, yeah, I saw some more hands over here. Yep, yeah. oh, over there first, <laughs> and then then this guy. Why do why do they form in rings? Rings. Oh, that's different. That's the way uh, the fairy rings are actually grown by usually they're called field mushrooms, arvensis. And it's because the mycelium are growing outward. These are permanent, um, they're not temporary, and they grow in the grasses and they expand outward from the center. They have rings that I think are like half a mile across in some places. And then the fruiting bodies on the end, that's the active mycelium. So it's sort of moved out from the center of where it was living and moving out again. Does that help? <laughs> that's, that's about it. No trees don't grow in circles. Um, I was wondering if you know about uh, the fungi that is called like the zombie fungi. It uh, controls right. the brains of insects. And yes, so it's very like the cordyceps. And it may actually be an Ophiocordyceps or a cordyceps species. And cordyceps does the same thing. So anybody that's really freaked out about the zombie one, um, cordyceps is it. Cordyceps, when the spores land on the caterpillar, it immediately begins to send in mycelia and starts altering the caterpillar's immune system. It also um, changes its nerve system, such that when the 
the mycelium, when the season is right and it's time for the fruiting body, it will direct the caterpillar to dig upwards from the soil and stop just a certain amount below the soil level uh, so that the fruiting body is there. If you go, all the harvesters for cordyceps will find that the caterpillars are always facing upwards like this, or sideways, but always within a certain distance of the soil surface. So all of those ones that attack insects are pretty much the same. They're immune, immune they suppress the immune system and they control the nerve system. The uh, zombie thing was uh, sort of a media thing to get people's attention, which it does. But there are ones that attack spiders, they attack katydids, um, particularly in tropical areas. Most of the ones in Australia uh, seem to be with the cicadas and the burrowing insects because they, again, the most in the underground. A lot of the tropical ones are actually in, the insect will freeze in the tree. It will actually climb a tree just to be there to disseminate the spores for the rest of them. So does that answer your question at all? Not yet. See, that's why, that's another reason why I give a great birth. And yeah, to me, to me, anything with medicine that affects insects and mammal, I mean, any of the mammal kingdom. Although fungi themselves are part of the mammal kingdom. I don't know most people know that. The plant, if there's a break off, they're not plants, they're considered fungi. They actually have um, chitin rather than um, the cellulose which plants have. So no, I use them with great caution and I would never overuse cordyceps. So I would not take it every day myself. Um, yes, that's um, I'm just wondering, can you transplant, for want of a better word, um, fungi in the forest by moving mycelium? Uh, if. <laughs> if you had the same trees it was growing on. So you need to know, you need to know your fungi. Which one are you thinking of? Oh, go back. In, in the rainforest of North Queensland, we grow Queensland maple. Yeah. And we've had a lot of trouble growing them in the open with very slow growth rate. So I've been fantasizing, if you want, about moving uh, mycelium from under maple trees, mature maple trees in rotten timber, and bringing it into the plantings. Okay, so mycelium in the soil, um, there has been some success with moving them. Um, transplanting mushrooms, say, you know, um, no, I'll just say Amanita muscaria, for example. You just can't take it. It, it has to like where it is. Um, it's really difficult. There's a place in Pennsylvania, um, there's a Penn State Extension campus, and they have this huge park, and they actually began um, grinding up the wood from broken limbs right next to the trees that lost it. And what they wound up with over time was this amazing fungal garden because the mycelia associated with the trees and the breakdown of the compost, it just seemed to be the perfect environment to get all sorts of interesting things. But it, for mycorrhizals, the answer is yes, if you've got a good source, uh, but be aware that you could be transporting other things as well. And we're done? Yep. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, I might have missed this because you had so much information in there as well. But. I know. As I said, I could talk for 12 weeks and still not cover everything. But I hope it was enough to get people excited about finding out more and maybe they wrote a little something down. If you have any questions about specific things Sorry, you want to do. Sorry, can I ask a yes, question? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I yes, yes. Was just a thank you for starting with that. I um, suffered from tinnitus and hearing loss from a workplace accident 20 years ago and I just got told during this festival that you should look into mushrooms as a symptom relief for tinnitus and that might be relevant to other people here in the music industry too. So. Um, anything that's neurorestorative? So I would start with the pleurotus and I would start with the ones with food um, and see if you get any relief. Uh, is it it's due to well you said a trauma so anything that's a trauma can that's, that's correct a trauma yeah. yeah so anything that's traumatic um, has the potential for being healed usually there's a nerve die off um, there's not as much research on it uh, you know official research but um, I would certainly give it a go it doesn't hurt and they taste great I mean it's a wonderful thing as a medicine if you're not sure it doesn't hurt you to do it I uh, think am I about up yep Five minutes. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. I'm gonna disassemble my computer here while we're doing that. Anybody else? Yep. 
Yeah, I was wondering, are spores um, killed with the cooking? Um, yes. They're deactivated. So, in general, once you've, once you've cooked them, you can't put the compost out and grow the mycelium or the spores. But the compost actually is still good compost. It's really good compost. Anybody else we got? Hi, I'm over here. Can you tell us anything more about indigenous microorganisms or inoculating kind of rice um, in the forest and using that in your garden? So I'm not into the ecological part yet. I mean, I know more about that in the US. Um, and there seems to be a natural thing. I, I really, I really advocate the natural process as much as possible. Um, when you move things from one place, that if you know that something's been there um, before, that's different, so historic. I would use the anything, any surveys that have been there before, and then you might try to inter introduce it, just as you would introduce trees that were native to that area that aren't there anymore. But mushrooms are really sensitive to environmental changes. Um, and uh, they will move and go where they will. So even if you try to transplant them, they might not show up, or they might stay underground for a long time and not fruit for a couple of years. It's uh, like orchids, they're very uh, temperamental. Um, if you're trying to reestablish a forest, the best thing to do is to start with the tall people, the trees, and then work your way down, and the rest will come. They will call the rest of the children of the forest to them. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes? Um, some of the health food stores have uh, powdered mushrooms as a supplement. Do you rate those or is it better to try and get whole foods from markets? Or I think the whole foods are great. Um, my partner is taking um, reishi as a powder, but we've sourced it from a really reputable source. We know that they're ethically grown, we know that they're organically grown, and we know that it's the fruiting body and you know we trust them that they haven't um, adulterated it with the mycelium. So those are the key things to know when you're buying it. I mean, there's anything can be labeled mushroom powder, high in beta glucans, and if you don't know the source, you don't really know what you're getting, because it can be any of those things that I mentioned earlier. And I hope that really helps a lot of people in making their choices. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I tend to plow through my talks, so the idea is not so much to go take it and teach you because there's just so much to teach um, that to give you a knowledge to, to go find out more. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Next we go. Well, thank you. We have Lane Bennett. What an amazing wealth of information about the magic and mushrooms. All the kinds of mushrooms. How blessed we are to have mushrooms. They're so awesome. Um, so next up at the Blue Lotus is uh, Karen Sutton and she's going to be doing a talk on turning failure upside down and that is on very soon. Please make sure you have a look at all of the amazing performers, artists, um, yoga teachers, the information's all over here. People in making their choices. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I tend to plow through my talks, but the idea is not so much to go take it and teach you because there's just so much to teach um, that to give you a knowledge to, to go find out more. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Let's give a very warm thank you to Kathleen Bennett. What an amazing wealth of information about the magic and mushrooms, all the kinds of mushrooms. How blessed we are to have mushrooms. They're so awesome.